We called it The Traveller, and its arrival changed us forever. Great cities were built on Mars and Venus. Mercury became a garden world. Human lifespan tripled. It was a time of miracles. We stared out at the galaxy and knew that it was our destiny to walk in the light of other stars. But the Traveler had an enemy. A darkness which had hunted it for eons across the black gulfs of space. Centuries after our golden age began, this darkness found us. And that was the end of everything. Welcome back, Guardians. Today, I'm going to cover a brief history of Destiny and Destiny 2 for new players looking to play Forsaken. If you are new to the lore, please be aware that Destiny's lore often requires interpretation, meaning you may hear different versions depending on the content creator you listen to. Also, I have a big announcement. The Destiny Down Under podcast, which is a podcast I co-host, has been invited to participate in an Australian Destiny 2 Forsaken Gambit showdown. In case you've been under a rock, Gambit is a new mode in Destiny 2 that combines player vs player and player vs environment in a 4v4 battle. The Destiny Down Under podcast crew will all be meeting in Sydney to participate in the showdown on the 5th of September, 6pm Australian Eastern Standard Time, which is 1am. 5th of September for Pacific time, but I'm sure you'll still be awake playing Forsaken. We'll be joined by various Australian and New Zealand musicians and elite athletes. It would be awesome if you come along and support our Australian content creators. You can find a live stream through my Twitch channel and the link will be below. Thank you to Activision for the flight and accommodation in Sydney. And similarly, thank you to Activision for the background gambit footage, which was captured at the Bungie Studios last week. As usual, the artwork at the beginning of this video was created by Gamma Trap and was made possible with your generous donations on Patreon. All Patreon donations go towards paying for the artwork, see the link below to support the art and get some cool rewards. This is Marlin Games and I hope you enjoy this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. Let's begin in relative chronological order. The earliest documented history of Destiny comes from the Books of Sorrow. The Books of Sorrow is a record of the Hive's history, the Hive being one of the major enemy races in Destiny. And like all history, it is written from a certain perspective. The book follows the thoughts and actions of Oryx. The Books of Sorrow describe how the Hive crash-landed into a planet known as the Fundament, and upon this planet the Hive were weak and preyed upon. The Hive did not live very long and fell victim to other creatures of the planet. In order to escape this cycle, Oryx sought the Worm Gods. The Worm Gods were also trapped upon the planet. The larvae from the Worm Gods formed a symbiotic pact with the Hive, granting them new strength and immortality. However, this newfound strength was not free. The Hive were bound to feed their worm through killing. The act of killing would feed their worm and in turn make them stronger. However, if they did not kill, their worm would consume them. This began the never-ending conquest of Oryx and his two siblings, Sabathun and Zyphu Arath. Oryx quickly adopted the sword logic. The sword logic, in my opinion, has two components. The first is that through killing you gain more power, and the second is more philosophical. You kill to prove you're a part of the final universe, the perfect universe. If you kill someone, they deserve to die because that proves that they are not part of the perfect universe. Oryx, using this sword logic, gained enough power to free both the Hive and the Worm Gods from the planet The Fundament. Upon freedom from the planet, Oryx shows mercy for a civilization that they encounter, and he is quickly betrayed by his sister and killed. However, Oryx unintentionally creates a throne world in his death. His power had grown so immensely, he just didn't die. His will created a cyst universe known as a throne world. A throne world acts as a death resilient mechanism. Killing Oryx in the physical world does not truly defeat him, and the only way to truly defeat Oryx and his sisters is to enter their own throne worlds and destroy them within. 
Oryx's son Crota would also go on to have a throne world. Strictly speaking, in the Books of Sorrow, throne worlds are closely tied to gaining power using the sword logic. The Hive kill, gain more power, become ascendant, and create throne worlds. However, that does not necessarily mean that is the only way to create a throne world. After further conquest and continuing to grow in power, Oryx realized that he did not take power from the worm gods, but rather they gifted him the worms, the symbiotic bargain. Oryx believes that this is why the worms consume the hive, because they did not adhere to the sword logic, they were gifted, and Oryx believes that his power will eventually plateau. Realizing this, Oryx kills the worm god Akka, gaining enormous amounts of power and discovering how to speak directly to the darkness. He creates the Tablets of Ruin, which allow him to commune with the darkness. Within Destiny's lore, the darkness has not yet been fully explained, and for the moment should be considered as a cosmic force of the universe, and its will is to create the perfect universe through eliminating anything that is weak. The Hive and Oryx are the closest representatives of the darkness that we face in Destiny. They are not the darkness, but they represent the darkness, similar to how the Traveler is not the light, but rather an agent of the light. With Oryx's newfound power from destroying Akka, creating the Tablets of Ruin, and communing with the Darkness, Oryx becomes the Taken King. He now has the ability to make loyal servants using the power of the Darkness. The process is not really explained, however all we know is that Oryx opens an aperture, an enemy is pulled through, and when they return, they are taken, and loyal to Oryx. Oryx decides to have a family with an unnamed mother, Crota, Nocris, and the Death Singers are born. Much of the family are considered failures, especially Crota and Nocris, as Nocris rejects the sword logic and is banished by his father. Nocris is a necromancer and rejects the sword logic, which makes sense as being a necromancer involves reviving the dead, whereas the sword logic would not want to bring back a defeated enemy, as that would be bringing back weakness back into the universe. Nocris branded as a heretic by his father Oryx, and he is banished and removed from the world's grave. The history of the Hive. We do not really know the timeline when Nocris is banished, however it is likely after Oryx creates the Dreadnought, as a Nocris statue exists upon the Dreadnought, and Nocris makes a pact with the worm god Zol. Crota is also somewhat of a failure, as he accidentally lets the Vex into Oryx's throne world. This is the first introduction of the Vex in the history of Destiny, one of the other major enemy races. The Vex are a liquid race, represented by the white goo in their robotic bodies, and all are connected with each other. They do not represent the light or the dark, and in fact, they only want a future where Vex exist. The Vex want to control reality and the future. After being banished for letting the Vex into Oryx's throne world, Crota battled through history to become a legendary demon. Unlike Nocris and Crota, the Death Singers were much liked by Oryx, and they created powerful weapons, like the Oversoul, which further enhanced death resilience in the throne worlds, and the weapon upon the Dreadnought that is seen destroying the Awoken. On the topic of the Dreadnought, the Dreadnought was created because Oryx wanted to protect his throne world more. The Dreadnought is described as a physical manifestation of Oryx's throne world. Oryx pushed his throne world into the material space to craft the Dreadnought. The Dreadnought is described as being within the throne world, while simultaneously the throne world being within the Dreadnought. Yeah, it is a bit confusing. The easiest way to think about this is Oryx's throne world is now mobile in the form of the ship, the Dreadnought. Lastly, it is important to note that Oryx encountered the Traveler, the sentient giant orb that represents the light. The Traveler operates under a different philosophy, and that is to build the perfect universe through creation, rather than creating the perfect universe by eliminating weakness. The philosophy of the Traveler repulses Oryx and those who follow the sword logic, and so naturally Oryx wants to consume the Traveler and the light, feeding his worm. In addition, the Traveler did try to kill Oryx whilst he was on the planet The Fundament, to prevent him making the bargain with the Worm Gods. We are made to question the intentions of the Traveler, because technically the Traveler made a tidal wave on the planet The Fundament that would kill trillions of beings, but the Traveler did this to prevent any of those species from making the symbiotic pact with the Worms, and therefore releasing the Worms from the planet. 
The Book of Sorrow ends with Oryx's siblings, Sabathun and Zaifu Arath, leaving Oryx and taking their throne worlds elsewhere. They have yet to reappear in Destiny 2, however, many heralds of Sabathun have appeared. The final page reveals Oryx's plan with writing the Books of Sorrow. His hope is that anyone who reads the book will understand his journey, understand the bargain that he made and his conquest to perfect the universe, and hopefully continue his work, therefore allowing him to live forever. This is where the weapon Touch of Malice comes into play. As Guardians, we collect the Books of Sorrow as calcified fragments, and we learn Oryx's story. In the Taken King DLC, we enter Oryx's Dreadnought and Throne World, kill his lieutenants and Oryx, and using materials from the dead, we craft the Touch of Malice. You could argue that as Guardians wielding the Touch of Malice, we continue to kill, we continue the sword logic, and we in fact continue the work of Oryx and the Darkness. Moving along to the next topic. Oryx never managed to catch the Traveler, and the Traveler continued to partner with and assist other civilizations to build and grow. One of the species that the Traveler assisted was the Elixni, or you may know them as the Fallen. The Fallen had their own Golden Age, a time of technological advancements and growth. The Traveler was so revered in their culture, spheres were worshipped, and servitors were considered as mini-gods, not only because of their shape, but also because servitors produced the life source of the Fallen, Aether. When you defeat the Fallen, you can see the Aether escape their body. Despite their now scavenger appearance, the Fallen were once considered a traditional and noble race, and consisted of many different houses. A house being a group of Fallen who serve the same Kel and worship a prime servitor. Akel is the leader of the house. Fallen have four arms which can regrow, however the Fallen leadership may remove the arms of Fallen who fail in combat and restrict growing their arms back. Therefore the most powerful Fallen will have four arms. Fallen with mechanical arms is a clear indication that they reject the Fallen hierarchy system and refuse to serve Akel. Varax and Tanix are examples of this. The downfall of the Fallen came from a catastrophic event known as the Whirlwind, which destroyed their Golden Age. The Fallen houses fell to infighting and their civilization crumbled. Some say that the Traveler abandoned the Fallen in their time of need. However, no one really knows what happened during the Whirlwind. Following the Whirlwind, the Fallen would be reduced to pirate scavengers tracking the Traveler and trying to reclaim their technology and culture. After leaving the Fallen, the Traveler would eventually settle in our system. Its flight path was detected and humanity put together a team to make contact. The team was led by Commander Jacob Hardy, who plans to intercept the Traveler on Mars. Jacob Hardy and his team successfully make contact with the Traveler and first-hand witness the Traveler's ability to terraform and change a planet. On a side note, it was Jacob Hardy's team, specifically Mihalova, that developed the AI system that would later form the foundation for Rasputin. Rasputin is a war mind, an artificial intelligent planetary defense system capable of using satellite weaponry. Successful contact with the Traveler on Mars marked the beginning of the Golden Age. Humans were gifted with new technologies and advancements. We knew more, we flew further, and we lived longer. With the Golden Age, humanity became an interplanetary species with bases on Venus and Mars. On Venus, research institutes were established such as the Ishtar Collective, and scientists discover Vex ruins on the planet. The Vex were introduced in the Books of Sorrow, however this is the first introduction of the Vex to humanity. The Vex are organisms within the white goo of robotic frames, with every Vex connected to the Vex network with the goal of creating a future in which only Vex exist. Some researchers from Ishtar Collective capture a Vex specimen on Venus and begin experimenting. They look into the Vex mind and see a perfect simulation of themselves, the researchers. The implication of this is that the researchers become concerned that if the Vex can perfectly simulate them, how do they know that they're not already in a simulation? 
The researchers aim to prove their existence by contacting the Warmind Rasputin. Rasputin's programming foundation was created by Mihailova from the Ares 1 team, who made contact with the Traveler, and was later modified by Anna Bray from the Clovis Bray Corporation. Clovis Bray was both a man and the name of the technological juggernaut company. The researchers believe that Rasputin was so complex that even the Vex could not simulate it, and therefore contacting Rasputin would prove their reality. They did make contact with Rasputin, and the Vex researchers then used Rasputin to help program virtual copies of themselves, virtual copies that they sent into the Vex network to explore. Rasputin was not the only technology created by Clovis Bray. Within the Clovis Bray laboratories, the researchers created the Exos, Siva, and Engrams. Exos are human minds transferred into robotic bodies. There is much controversy surrounding Clovis Bray practices, with some reporting experimentation being conducted off-world in order to avoid ethical guidelines, as the experiments would never be approved on Earth. The process of Cade being converted into an Exo is also shrouded in ethical concern. Cade agreed to become an Exo in order to clear his debt, and so you have to question whether Clovis Bray prey upon vulnerable citizens when conducting experiments. The creation of SIVA is also questionable. Once again, the patients comment on their coercion into the program, and one of the lead researchers discover that the company had a mortality rate of 50 to 60% for injectable technology. SIVA was an injectable technology with wide applications. It is a nanotechnology. Its initial development focused on creating the perfect colonist, modifying humans to make them more durable during space travel, strengthening their immune system, reinforcing their skeletons and musculature, and accelerating synapse function. However, SIVA could also be used to build entire cities. The mites could be programmed to build and therefore were also responsible for many of the technological advancements during the Golden Age. However, others also planned for SIVA to be a weapon. Rasputin would also later claim control over SIVA and its programming. Engrams were a way to encrypt and protect Golden Age technology. While humanity continued to grow and prosper during the Golden Age, they were unaware of the threat the Traveller brought with it. The Fallen wanting to reclaim the Traveller, the Hive wanting to consume the Traveller, and the Darkness wanting to win the Cosmic War against the Light. We don't really know what occurred during the collapse, what exactly happened, and the closest we get is a memory from Cade in his journal which describes this oppressive cosmic force, presumably the darkness. With the arrival of the darkness in our system, the Warmind Rasputin detected this threat approaching and took control over all defensive assets developed during the Golden Age. By Rasputin's calculations, there was very little chance of surviving the threat, and Rasputin predicted that the best chance of humanity surviving would be to cripple the Traveller. Rasputin believed that crippling the Traveller would force the Traveller to produce some sort of defense mechanism to protect itself. Rasputin predicted that if he did not disable the Traveller, the Traveller would flee. Most lore tabs indicate that Rasputin did in fact shoot the Traveller, however, this is not confirmed. Whether the darkness crippled the Traveller or Rasputin did, the result was the same. The Traveller was crippled and fell silent over Earth. But, in its dying breath, it fulfilled Rasputin's prediction and produced a defensive mechanism. The Ghost. Ghosts would go on to revive the dead to produce Guardians, the first of their kind. Never in the Traveller's history had a Guardian been produced, and some may argue that the Traveller had fled all previous encounters with the Darkness, and therefore never had a reason to produce Ghosts and Guardians. Ghosts scan the dead and can somehow determine their compatibility with the new Guardian. Once the Ghosts choose their match, they revive the dead for the first time and they are born again as a Guardian. However, newly born Guardians have no recollection of their previous lives. The ghosts allow guardians to wield the light within three elements, solar, arc, and void. Technically, guardians could wield the light as a weapon in any way they seem fit. However, over time, classes developed based on the guardians' personalities, hunters, titans, and warlocks. Within each class, subclasses developed, such as hunter night stalkers, titan strikers, warlock dawnblade, 
The subclasses are passed down like martial art knowledge, and new guardians hone their skills with each technique. During the collapse, many humans tried to escape Earth in colony ships, and while many perished during the escape, some were transformed in space. Somehow, humans aboard colony ships were turned into the Awoken, in what has only been described as being caught between the light and the darkness. And in that space, the Awoken were born. The original Awoken are not human, not Exo, and not Guardian, yet still extremely powerful and have mysterious abilities. The Awoken Queen, Mara Sov, describes her mother as Starlight and her father as the Dark, once again reinforcing their creation between light and dark. The Awoken took shelter amongst the reef and call it home. Reefborn Awoken consider their heritage very important, and any Awoken who leaves the reef for the last city is looked down upon. Following the collapse, the dormant Vex suddenly reactivated on Mercury, Venus, and Mars. While the ghosts seem to take careful consideration before resurrecting the dead and creating guardians, not all guardians were good. In the early times following the collapse, some guardians became warlords, terrorizing the surrounding citizens. Some guardians rose up against those warlords and formed the Iron Lords, guardians dedicated to protecting humanity. Lord Saladin was a part of this group. Survivors from the Collapse begin to gather around the crippled traveller on Earth, and this forms the last city and marks the beginning of the City Age. City defences are built, specifically the construction of the city wall by the Titans. As expected, gathering many people around a central point below the traveller resulted in political struggles and violent conflicts, known as the Faction Wars. Eventually, peace was established and government formed, called the Consensus, which consists of the Speaker, the Vanguard, and a representative from each faction. The Speaker claims to speak for the Traveller during its silence. However, during his capture in the Red War, the Speaker admits to never hearing the Traveller. Until this day, it still remains uncertain if the Speaker truly represented the Traveller or simply took advantage of a lack of leadership. The Vanguard currently includes and is soon to change with Forsaken, a core array for the Warlocks, Cade 6 for the Hunters, and Zavala for the Titans. Zavala also acts as the Vanguard Commander. In regards to Cade 6, Andrew Brask was a previous Vanguard Hunter. Cade replaced him following Andrew's death. The Vanguard mentor new Guardians, teach them how to wield the light and coordinate missions in order to protect the city. Meanwhile, the Hive begin to build an army on the moon to form an invasion of Earth, and plan to destroy and consume the Traveller. Likewise, the Fallen are eager to claim the Traveller, and the Battle of Six Fronts occur. The Fallen attack the last city and resting place of the Traveller from six different fronts. Four Orders of Titans successfully repel the attack. Following Six Fronts, Osiris is appointed the Vanguard Commander under recommendation from Saint-14, the Speaker's son. The Iron Lords look to rebuild civilization with their discovery of Siva in an old Clovis Bray facility. While initially believing Siva could be used to rebuild civilization, Siva was found to be under control of Rasputin, who uses Siva to kill nearly all of the Iron Lords. Lord Saladin and Lord Ephrodite were the only Iron Lords to remain. It is believed that Ephrodite had already left the Iron Lords and was not actually at the battle to claim Siva. Why Rasputin refused the Iron Lords access to Siva is unknown. Maybe Rasputin was no longer on our side, maybe Rasputin predicted that the Iron Lords could not control Siva and it would do more harm to humanity than good. Sometime following the Iron Lords, three Guardians enter the Vault of Glass. In the vault, the powers of the Vex are magnified and it is described as almost a research chamber for the Vex. For example, in the Vault of Glass, the Vex can erase you from history. However, outside the vault, they are yet to achieve that. Of the three members, Kabir sacrifices himself, combining his light with the Vex to create a weapon known as the Aegis. The Aegis is used to destroy the Templar during the Vault of Glass raid. Praetith is trapped by the Vex and lost to time, however he is able to communicate with Guardians by making a transmitting device. Bahanan escapes, however suffers madness or nightmares, and would be later killed by Dredgen Yor, a Guardian who embraces the darkness. While in his Vanguard Commander role, Osiris became obsessed with the Vex and learning about the darkness. 
his prophecies are considered dangerous by the speaker as the speaker believes it will disrupt unity within the city. Osiris left the tower and his post as vanguard commander. The city would then coordinate its next major defense against the fallen at the Battle of Twilight Gap. This time the House of Devils attacked the city. Lord Saladin led the city defenses. Zavala and Shax at this stage are Lord Saladin's students. Shax leads a counter-offense against orders and the city is able to repel the fallen. Following this, Saint 14 embarks on a crusade to pursue Osiris, however Saint 14 would later be found dead, killed by the Vex, however he was so powerful that the Vex honoured him in a burial chamber. During the Battle of Twilight Gap, the House of Wolves looked to join the fray, however Mara Sov, Queen of the Reef, engaged the wolves at the Reef Belt, despite her dislike for the city. Marasov likely believed that if the last city fell, the reef could also be in danger. The battles between Marasov and the House of Wolves would be known as the Reef Wars. Varixus was the original House of Wolves Kel. Over the course of the Reef Wars, he was replaced with Skolas. Towards the end of the Reef Wars, Varix would betray Skolas, providing vital information leading to Skolas' capture. Rosil Zia, a previous hero to the city, goes to the moon in search of the hive. He encounters a wizard in the Hellmouth that begins his corruption and eventually transformation into Dredgen Yor, wielding the infamous hand cannon Thorn, a weapon that can kill guardians by draining their light. Dredgen Yor would go on to kill Jaren Ward, with Shin Malfur later inheriting Jaren Ward's hand cannon and ghost. This is one of the only creation of a guardian that didn't require the individual to be dead first. Shin Malfur would later kill Dredgen Yor with the last word. Following that, Guardians attempt to reclaim the moon from the Hive, however, fail. The battle is called the Great Disaster. The Hive forces were led by the son of Oryx, Crota, who impaled many Guardians with his sword and resulted in the permanent death of those Guardians. Retreating from the moon, and despite the Vanguard enforcing a no-go zone, Ariana 3 starts to build a fire team aimed at enacting revenge on Crota and defeating the Hive. Ariana 3 leads a fire team of guardians consisting of Eris Morn, Vel Talo, Oma Agar, Saimoda, and Tolan the Shattered. Tolan the Shattered chases Hive knowledge and wants to learn the Death Singer's song in the Hellmouth, and he does in fact meet a Death Singer. And upon his death, he accesses the Hive Overworld and claims to be our messenger to and from the Hive Overworld. Ariana 3, Vel, Omar and Sai are all brutally murdered in the Hellmouth. Eris Morn survives in the Hellmouth, however at the cost of her ghost and light. Even though Crota was successful at the battle for the moon, for some reason Crota retreats to his throne world, leaving the Hive to continue to build an army on the moon. The Ahamkara dragon-like creatures that turned up when the Traveller arrived were ordered to be hunted to extinction. However, there are clues that at least one still remains. The Wish Dragons were seen as too dangerous by the Vanguard, assumingly because of the power they had. Ahamkara remnants remain in armor sets and the bones of Ahamkara continue to have influence over their wearers. Now, that is just a brief history of what occurred before the player entered Destiny. And I have left out a whole bunch of stuff. But regardless, let's move on to your history now as a Guardian within the game. In Destiny 1, you are revived in the Cosmodrone as a freshly born Guardian. The Fallen are digging through the Cosmodrone, and while we don't know exactly what for, the Vanguard suspects they are looking for Rasputin. Alternatively, the Fallen may have been looking for Siva, because we know that in the future the Fallen actually find Siva and use Siva to enhance themselves. Regardless, we seek out Rasputin, hoping to create a powerful ally. We access Rasputin and reopen the array, giving Rasputin access to the entire network. However, it is still not clear whether Rasputin is friend or foe. Despite the restrictions placed on the moon due to the hive infestation, you are sent to the moon to investigate a guardian that went dark in the hive fortress. After destroying a number of prominent hive, you discover siphon witches that have captured a shard of the traveler, and through ritual they have been draining the traveler's light. After defeating the witches, light begins to return to the Traveller, and then you encounter the Exo Stranger. The Exo Stranger claims there is a threat much greater than the Hive, and encourages you to find the Black Garden and destroy its heart. We don't really know what the Black Garden is, or what is at its heart, 
However, my theory is that the heart of the Black Garden is a form of the worms, the same worms that Oryx introduced to the Hive in the Books of Sorrow, the same worms that granted power and immortality. One theory is that the Vex worship the worms at the Black Heart in order to understand how to harness the power without forming a symbiotic bond with the worms and introducing the worm to their mind fluid. Of course, we don't know where the Black Garden is, we have to pay a visit to the Awoken in the Reef, which provides our first encounter with Prince Aldrin. The Queen knows the location of many secret things, including the Black Garden and the location of the Nine. If you are wondering who the Nine are and their purpose, there is very little information on this topic and it is still highly debated and discussed. After collecting a Vex Gate Lord's eye, the Queen exchanges the coordinates for the Black Garden. You go through the Black Garden on Mars and destroy three bosses, the Soul Progeny, which are Vex from the past, present and future. The Exo Stranger thanks the Guardian for their work and leaves the Guardian a weapon, the Stranger's Rifle. You then join a raid team of Guardians to enter the Vault of Glass and destroy the Vex, including Atheon. Destroying the Vex in the Black Garden and the Vault of Glass is thought to have stopped the Vex from creating their own version of reality and the city can breathe easy for a moment. Moving on to the Dark Below DLC. Eris Mort appears in the tower, remembering that she has been trapped in the Hellmouth with the Hive since trying to stop Crota with Ariana 3's fire team. She has lost her light in the Hellmouth. She returns to the tower with mixed reception and informs you of Crota's summoning to the moon and invasion of Earth. We stop the Hive ritual to resurrect Crota back to the moon. Once again, we're not quite sure why he left in the first place considering the decisive victory at the Great Disaster. Regardless, he needs to be re-summoned to the moon to invade Earth. After stopping the summoning ritual, you join a team of Guardians to enter Crota's End Raid and destroy Crota in his throne world, so that he may never be summoned again. Eris Morn had acquired the knowledge about the throne worlds told to her by Tolan the Shattered. Moving on to the House of Wolves DLC. Following the Reef Wars, the Queen of the Reef claimed leadership over the House of Wolves, with many of the House of Wolves' leadership locked into the Prison of Elders. The House of Wolves expansion follows Skolas' attempt to reclaim the House of Wolves. The Queen actually captured Skolas at the end of the Reef Wars, but sent Skolas as a gift and an apology to the Nine. The Queen sent him as an apology for Prince Aldrin's spies poking around the Nine's territory. When Skolas arrived at the Nine, the Nine set him free, and this marks the beginning of Skolas looking to reclaim the House of Wolves. Skolas tries to reunite all of the fallen houses under one banner, claiming to be the Kel of Kells. However, he was unsuccessful following attempts to get hold of Vex technology to modify his forces, and also using Vex technology to pull the House of Wolves through time. Skolas is eventually recaptured and thrown back in the Prison of Elders, Guardians would go on to kill Skolas within the prison. Moving on to the Taken King DLC. Eris Morn and Osiris warn Queen of the Reef Mara Solve about the arrival of Oryx, Crota's father. The opening scenes of the Taken King begin with the battle for Saturn, with the Awoken fleet taking Oryx's dreadnought head on. Queen of the Reef Mara Solve summons the living weapon, the Harbingers, which appear ineffective against the dreadnought. Oryx responds with a weapon of his own, created by his daughters, the Death Singers. The entire Awoken fleet is destroyed, the Queen, her paladins, and her Techians aboard her ship are thought killed in action, and Prince Aldrin crash lands on Mars. While on Mars, Prince Aldrin finds the Kel of Kings, one of the few remaining fallen houses, and is thought that Prince Aldrin claims leadership over the House of Kings. You also encounter a new threat on Mars, the Taken. Oryx opens an aperture, takes his enemies, and they return as loyal servants. After acquiring a stealth drive, Guardians board the Dreadnought and disable the super weapon, establishing a transmat zone upon the Dreadnought. We fight our way to a portal only to discover that we need to become Ascendant to enter a rupture to face Oryx. We go back to the moon and obtain a shard from Crotus Crystal, and the Guardian looks to obtain more stealth technology from Rasputin to infiltrate Crotus Funeral. We use Crota's crystal and the stealth tech to enter the funeral and absorb Crota's soul. Using the crystal full of Crota's soul, Guardians appear to be ascendant and can pass through the portal. We confront Oryx and destroy his physical form, only to see Oryx retreat to his throne world. This is somewhat confusing due to the nature of the Dreadnought, as the Dreadnought can technically be considered already his throne world. Regardless, 
Following defeating Oryx in the physical realm, Eris Morn collects a shard from his sword, Willbreaker. The shard will later be used to make one of the three exotic swords. You enter the raid through a portal to Oryx's throne world to ensure his true death. You progress through the raid, killing the war priest, Golgroth, Death Singers, and finally, Oryx himself. You collect the items Blade of Famine, Shroud of Eonuk, and the Ravenous Heart from the War Priest, Death Singers, and Oryx, respectively, in order to create the Touch of Malice. The Touch of Malice is the plan that Oryx mentioned in the Books of Sorrow. This was Oryx's plan that in the event of his death, someone would make a weapon like Touch of Malice that would continue to kill and create the perfect universe. And of course, Guardians made the weapon. Moving on to the Rise of Iron DLC. Rise of Iron begins with a strange infection spreading amongst guardians known as Tech Mites. The Vanguard requests the help from a group of citizens known as Owl Sector. Owl Sector discover that the Tech Mites originate from a Clovis Bray laboratory and realize that the Tech Mites are in an early version of SIVA, a nanotechnology. They discover experiment nodes from Clovis Bray with the development of the SIVA Mites, with some of the experiments resulting in death and serious side effects. They discover Clovis Bray's notes leading to a solution for the crisis. However, Guardians are not necessarily cured, but rather the Siva tech is suppressed. Because the Clovis Bray experiments never developed a cure, only a way to suppress the Siva mites. The Fallen House of Devils had also been investigating Siva, digging into Golden Age research labs around the system. The Fallen Splices are born, with Fallen merging themselves with Siva technology. Guardians track down and destroy Sebex Perfected after reclaiming Felwinter's Peak. We also discover that the Fallen were experimenting with Hive. We destroy a captive Hive Ogre that had been infused with Siva from a Fallen Priest. With the help of Shiro 4, they devise a plan to enter the Siva Replication Complex, the Clovis Bray Origin Center of Siva. You destroy the Siva Replication Chamber using a self-destruct mechanism. On returning to the Iron Temple, Saladin gives you a sword and pronounces you as the next generation. Of Iron Lords. A team of Guardians then enter the Wrath of Machine raid and destroy Axis inside the Perfection Complex, therefore eliminating the Siva threat. Moving on to Destiny 2. Destiny 2 begins with the Red Legion led by Gaul launching an invasion on Earth. Gaul plans to steal the Traveler's Light as he believes he is worthy of being chosen. A device captures a Traveler and cuts a link between the Traveler and Guardians. The speaker goes missing during the attack and is later killed. It is revealed that Gol came into control of the Red Legion through a military takeover and had exiled the previous Cabal Emperor, Emperor Callus. Emperor Callus claims that the Cabal Empire has lost many of its virtues during Gol's reign, such as its multi-species composition and vast technologies. Callus is keen to enact his revenge on Gol and rebuild the Empire with the most powerful species in the system. In order to reclaim your light, you head to the EDZ to find a shard of the Traveler that broke off during the collapse. After fighting your way to the shard, you reclaim your light. Meanwhile, Zavala has gone to Titan to establish a counter-offense, however, he was not aware that the Titan was overrun by Hive. After securing the command center on Titan, Guardians claim a Golden Age CPU to crack a Cabal message, revealing the Red Legion plan to use a super weapon known as the Almighty. You make contact with Cade 6 on Nessus and a core ray on Io, reuniting the Vanguard. Ashamir provides intel that blowing up the Almighty will also blow up the Sun. You have to board the Almighty and destroy the Link with the Sun and then return to the last remaining city to face Gol. Meanwhile, Gol has been successful in siphoning the Traveler's Light and uses Guardian-like abilities to fight. Regardless, Gol is defeated, however upon his death resurrected as what seems to be Light. The Traveler awakens in its greatest moment of need, obliterating Gol. A shockwave of light is sent out across the system and a mysterious space fleet is reactivated. The Leviathan appears above Nessus and Emperor Callus returns. Emperor Callus wants us to join his forces. The Leviathan was the ship he was exiled upon. However, he also uses it as a threat for new species and to ensure that they either die or join him. Upon boarding the Leviathan, we discover we have not met the real Callus only a robot, Callus. Callus continues to promise us more power than light could ever offer. Moving on to Curse of Osiris. Panoptes, a Vex mind, is trying to create a future where there is no light or darkness, just the Vex. Osiris was investigating a simulation of the Vault of Glass when the Vex reactivated. 
Osiris attempts to send his ghost, Sagira, for help. However, Sagira is damaged in the retreat. Guardians retrieve Sagira from Akurare and visit Mercury to see if the cult of Osiris can assist in Sagira's revival. Using information from Brother Vance, the Guardian places Sagira's shell in a device that allows her to fuse her consciousness with our ghost. Eventually, Panoptes is trapped down and destroyed by Guardians with the assistance of Osiris. Osiris returns to the Infinite Forest, essentially many Vex simulations, and he remains there to monitor the Vex and prevent any future Vex plans. The Leviathan continues to swallow Nessus and injects the planetary core Argos. Guardians enter the raid lair to clear the planetary core, and Emperor Kallus is continually pleased with Guardians. Moving on to the Warmind expansion, Anna Bray is the adopted child of the Bray family, infamous for founding Clovis Bray, the technological juggernaut responsible for Exos, the Warmind Rasputin, Siva, and Engrams. Anna Bray was a golden gun hunter who fought at the Battle of Twilight Gap and faked her death. She was presumed dead right up until the Warmind expansion. As a guardian, Anna Bray has no recollection of her past and has returned to Mars to discover the history of Clovis Bray. While on Mars, Anna Bray requests assistance from you, the Guardian. Falling warsats are melting the ice and releasing Frozen Hive, and the worm god Zol, which had been frozen on Mars since the collapse. There was a loose connection that the Traveler awakening and releasing a shockwave of light at the end of Destiny 2 is somewhat responsible for the events about to take place. For some reason, Rasputin has triggered the warsats to fall out of the sky. The web law suggests that the hive on the moon technically was not the first contact with the hive, and in fact, there was hive present on Mars. During the collapse, Anna Bray and Master Reinhardt suspect that Rasputin froze certain areas of Mars to trap the hive and the worm god Zol. It is revealed that Rasputin's foundation was created by Mia Halova from the Ares 1 team. She designed their foundation for the AI system. At some point, Clovis Bray acquired this and continued to develop the AI to what we see now with Rasputin. Specifically, Anna Bray was the one to develop Rasputin's consciousness and intuition. Anna Bray considered Rasputin like a child and allowed him to absorb great works of philosophy, military history, art, and even comedies. Following this, Rasputin develops independence, begins to rewrite his own code, he upgrades weapon systems and warsats without prompting. However, Anna Bray's last words about Rasputin is that there is one thing she never taught him, and that is trust. And she is uncertain if she can trust Rasputin. You fight your way to the Clovis Bray facility on Mars, where it is revealed that Rasputin was the only war mind and previous communications with Rasputin on Earth was remotely controlled from Mars. The core of Rasputin's mind is trapped on Mars. We fight our way to Rasputin's core, as the hive also swarm the core. Rasputin provides assistance in the form of the Valkyrie, a spear-like weapon, to help eliminate the hive. Once again, we are not sure if Rasputin is friendly or just trying to preserve itself by allowing us to defeat the Hive. Anna Bray and Zavala have a conflict. Zavala criticizes Anna Bray for not being present during the Red War and chasing Rasputin. Zavala does not think Rasputin will help humanity, calling him a broken weapon. You are now aware of Zol, who is trying to destroy Rasputin on Mars. You are sent to the EDZ to recover a shard from the Traveler, as the plan is to use the Traveler's shard to lure Zol. Anna Bray believes Zol is impossible to defeat without Rasputin. You try to find Zol's feeding ground to place the crystal and stumble upon Nocris. Nocris is revealed to be a necromancer, which is unusual for the Hive, remembering that the Hive worship the sword logic, which means if something is killed, it deserves to be killed, it is weak. Yet Nocris brings him back through necromancy. Like I previously mentioned, he was exiled and disowned by Oryx for this. Upon defeating Nocris, you place the Traveler's Fragment and Zol appears. Zol attacks Rasputin. Anna suggests using the Valkyrie to kill Zol. You supercharge the Valkyrie and kill the Worm God, Zol. Rasputin talks directly to Zavala, Anna Bray, and you. Rasputin shuns the Vanguard and says he'll define his own reality, that he will defend humanity on now his own terms, and that he has no equal. Rasputin launches a new Warsat network solely under his control. Zavala is still concerned as ever, yet Anna and Bray implies that she can keep working with Rasputin. The Exo Stranger from Destiny 1 is thought to be Elsie Bray and is revealed in the Lost Memory Fragments within Clovis Bray. 
Emperor Kallus once again opens the Leviathan and enlists the assistance of Guardians to destroy some unwelcome cabal aboard his ship. Upon defeating Valkaor, we once again win Kallus' favour and he acknowledges the strength of Guardians and wishes that we would join his empire and train the next generation of cabal troops. The Taken appear on Io, and a strange portal opens that leads to the weapon Whisper of the Worm. The theory I would like to suggest is that the Whisper of the Worm is a weapon created by Zol, given to Guardians, so that when we kill, the power from killing is transferred to Zol. We are feeding Zol through the Whisper of the Worm. By doing so, Zol is rejecting the sword logic, he is admitting that Guardians are stronger and not challenging us. What he is doing is allowing us to be stronger, but still feed him. The Whisper of the Worm is similar to Touch of Malice, but a different version of the Sword Logic. The Whisper of the Worm implies that Zol is still alive, despite him being defeated on Mars. And that <laughs> is a sort of brief history of Destiny, from Destiny 1 to Destiny 2 Warmind Expansion. If you've made it this far, congratulations. I hope you've enjoyed this latest Destiny 2 lore episode. If you're new to the channel, I, at this point, I normally would give you a keyword that you can put in the comments below if you can't think of a comment yourself. And considering Forsaken is the next release, you can just leave the word Forsaken in the comments below if you'd like to support the channel and you cannot think of a comment. As usual, it has been a pleasure. This is Mylan Games. Peace.